Welcome, everybody, to this latest edition of the Silver Screen Action Figure Podcast. This is your host, Andre Joseph, and today's topic is on the 1987 classic RoboCop. Uh, one of my favorite films of all time spawned a franchise that has quite a mixed bag of sequels and TV shows and remake. And joining me today to discuss the toy line from these films and TV show is uh, our friend Mike Schiavo from our Ghostbusters episode. Say hello. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Mike Schiavo here. Yeah, so RoboCop. Uh, I got to buy that for a dollar. <laughs> Just had to get that out of the way <laughs> real quick. Um, so RoboCop, as I remember, when it came out in 87... I didn't see it in the theater, of course, because it was R-rated and superbly violent. But um, yes. I remember as a kid, I was in Brooklyn with my grandma and my cousin, and we were going grocery shopping. And I remember seeing the poster on a bus ad, and it was like one of the coolest things I ever saw. Because you got to remember, in 87, there weren't a whole lot of superhero movies in that day. You had Superman 4, and that killed the franchise yeah. completely. And other than that, you know, it was the Spielberg era. It was George Lucas with Star Wars and, you know, MTV and pop culture. But this poster of a guy in a robotic cyborg suit was just eye-opening to me. And I know <laughs> that the inspiration for the writers was looking at, I think, the Blade Runner poster. And that's kind of what gave him the idea for the conceit of RoboCop. So I didn't see the movie until it hit cable about a year later. And I always watched pretty much from the very beginning up until he starts getting his memories back. But in that span of time, it was just such a, a mind-blowing thing to see a film with so much violence, so much intensity in creating a, a world where capitalism has taken over an entire city to the point where the police are sort of privatized and, you know, you have these Wall Street type dudes that just don't give a shit about anything except making money. Even if somebody gets killed in the boardroom, nobody gives a damn. And, you know, just really um, eye-opening stuff that became more eye-opening as I became older and understood the themes. Um, but otherwise, just watching how this dead cop played by Peter Weller becomes this uh, massive cyborg and fights crime. I mean, as a kid, you couldn't help yourself. Like, you would want to get that action figure once it came out. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, what was your earliest experience with RoboCop? <clears throat> I remember, uh, I didn't, like you, I didn't see RoboCop in the theaters. I actually... Um, my father brought it home on VHS, and I remember watching it with my my my, my family, my brother, my little brother, my mother, my father, and I just remember like being like, "Holy shit, what am I watching?" Like, um, I knew it had like you know just like the title like Rebel, like oh, it had it was like robots, but I didn't think I was gonna see what I was gonna see. And I was just I watching it. I was blown away a by the violence in it, and then just watching this guy become RoboCop. It was like you know eye opening and definitely something that last that left a uh, lasting impression on me. And um, it it was just kind of, it kind of made me wonder like you know just watching it. I was like just in shock of how they did everything. And that was like, I remember watching RoboCop and remembering having one of the first time I've been wanting to see how a movie was made like that. Like I wanted to watch like how they made RoboCop. And that was like one of the first things that really got me, you know, wanting to look more into like behind the scenes and like just out of, uh, not just doing the acting end of the movies, but you know, getting hands on behind the scenes with like, you know, how everything else is done that was the one that really kind of pointed me in that direction. For the longest time, there was always a toss up when people would ask me what was my favorite film growing up or my favorite film of all time. It would always be a toss up between the original Robocop and the original Ghostbusters. And to be quite honest, as I've grown older, I always lean more towards Robocop because those themes that were so 
I mean, ahead of its time in 1987, have become more reality in 2018, 2019. And just the simple fact that it was a film that really, I mean, it was an adult sci-fi thriller. It was never intended to be this big franchise that would spawn video games and toys and so forth. You know, Paul Verhoeven, the director, was trying to create a Jesus film. And a Jesus mm -hmm. film in which you have this corrupt society and here is an honest, hardworking cop with a family who's basically his life is taken from him, <clears throat> not necessarily by Clarence Bodiger and his gang, but primarily by the system that enabled those guys to run their illegal operations. And so to suddenly take this cop and make him into a product in order to do the corporation's bidding and then that product suddenly starts to have a conscience and remembers who he was um there is this like peter weller had said in an interview it's about how that society could take everything away from you but they can't take your soul so i thought that was right. very profound and something that really resonates Every time I think about that movie and every time I watch it, I could quote it verbatim because every character from Clarence Bodiger to Dick Jones to Bob Morton is memorable and quotable, you know. So that's to me, is the greatness of that original film. And Peter Weller's performance is completely um, the best of anybody that would take that role on afterwards. The shit that that guy had to go through, um, it's oh, just... Yeah. No comparison whatsoever. Well, he was, he had to be, well, not a lot of people, I don't think a lot of people know this, but uh, Peter Weller, before he got to roll Robocop, the dude was running like a triathlon, mm -hmm. you know, and he was in just in like phenomenal shape. And he would like, this suit would weigh like maybe upwards of like a hundred pounds. And he's like trapped in this thing. From like the moment he put it on until like the end of the day, there's there's no getting out of it, and um, you know, just like being able to a wear the suit, b move around in the suit, and then act while wearing all the prosthetics, all the armament. You got to give it to the guy. I mean, and this is before computer. Uh, computer generated backgrounds and everything or really you know we, we didn't have it you, you had to go out and get hands on and i give peter weller and the entire production team of the original Ro robocop so much credit for doing all that and you know it, it's i i like watching movies like that where you're not dependent upon cgi where you actually have to go out and get your hands dirty and you know make a film like that and i think that's one of the reasons robocop the original one you know sticks with us to this day and has a uh, staying power i also want to say one more thing about weller and to touch on what you just said uh yeah remember they shot this movie in the summer in dallas yeah and it was one of like the hottest summers at that time and I remember looking at interviews with uh, Ronnie Cox and Kurtwood Smith, where sometimes they would talk about how hot it would get on the set. And, you know, obviously it was a terrible, like a tough production, but everybody would always look to Peter and say, my God, he's got to wear this chunk of armor half the time. He's sweating bullets. He was literally like losing a couple of pounds a day in the suit. And the funny thing was um, they would do this later in the remake, but, the way that they originally could see RoboCop, he was supposed to like be lightning fast and he was supposed to jump and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And then once they actually had the suit ready, they had the suit ready maybe a couple weeks into shooting. And clearly this guy who had already been doing like all this uh, miming techniques with a coach, now he suddenly had to slow his movements down. And when people saw that on set, they thought, oh, no, this shit's got, not going to work. But then once they actually finished it yeah. and they added those sound effects with the footsteps and, you know, that motorized sound every time he shows up in a scene, I mean, that completely changed the whole picture altogether. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it would have lost something if he was that fast in the original one because I don't think it would have 
like with the technology that they had to make the movie, I don't think it would have looked good. I think it would have looked overly cartoony. So I think, you know, that's uh, an example of a good mistake. You know, something that couldn't be, that wanted to happen, but they just couldn't do it. So I think it actually, in the end, worked out in um, the movie's benefit. Absolutely. Um, so now we go into 1988. And like I said, when Orion made this film, they had no intentions of this being a franchise. Orion had a number of flops at that time. They were mostly known for more Oscar-worthy pictures like Platoon and Amadeus. They were not really in the franchise business the way that Warner Brothers or Universal would be. So for RoboCop to be a success and for kids to get into it, you know, in repeated viewings on TV... Uh, they knew they had to capitalize on it. They had to make the money wherever they could. So there were video games. Uh, Marvel did a comic book that lasted a couple of years. Um, but the big thing was this animated series that Marvel had produced. And it only played, I remember, on Channel 11 on Sunday mornings during the Marvel Action Hour. I don't know if you remember that, Mike. Yeah, that was... I remember the Marvel Action Hour. That was yeah, Fantastic Four. Iron Man, I remember that. Yeah, well, when they first started it in 88, it was RoboCop. It was the repeats of the 80s Spider-Man cartoon and Dino Riders. Uh, so in the case of RoboCop, I mean, it was essentially it was the movie um, to a point. I mean, the, you have like the intro scene where you had the, uh, the recreation of how he got killed and how he became RoboCop. Um, but then the cartoon would drift off more into like these sort of thematic storylines, you know, morality tales. A number of the characters from the film were in it. And surprisingly enough, the, the last episode they produced, he takes on Clarence Bodiger. Like Clarence Bodiger apparently didn't die in this continuity and Robo's out for revenge against him and the gang. So I always thought like I didn't see this until it was on YouTube a few years ago. It threw me off like a motherfucker. Let's put it that way. But I do remember when it was on, and I have some of the VHS tapes. Um, and it was as a result of that cartoon that Kenner decided to make an action figure line that was kind of like a weird hybrid between the film and this Marvel animated series. And that was Robocop and the Ultra Police. Um, right, I remember that. So this was interesting. So Kenner puts these figures out. These were, um, I would say, they're about six inches tall. And the big feature of it was the Robo Caps. So they had yeah. these little backpacks in the back of the figures where you could actually like have them look like they're firing caps. So when they're pointing at their guns at each other, caps would fire, and they have the rolls that come with the figures, so you could like, you know, go to town with it, and then probably you have to buy extra rolls of Toys R Us. Um, and you know, again, they they selected some of the characters from the film, including the title character, uh, his partner, Ann Lewis, uh, played by Nancy Allen. And later they actually added Sergeant Reed, which I didn't know about until I saw the figure in a flea market back in the 90s. I got for like two bucks. Um, and each figure also, in terms of the police characters, they had what they called like a robo armor. So each one would have kind of like... Um, like this guy Birdman Barnes in this orange jumpsuit, which I have, uh, he would have like this blue metallic thing on his chest. I guess it's supposed to be like a big chest protector. Um, yeah, like a chest protector. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, one of the issues I always had with the RoboCop figure itself. Now, I remember getting this, I think it was here for my birthday or probably like one holiday. And uh, we were over at R.H. Tugs down near the ferry, and we're, I'm at dinner with my parents. They gave me this present. I didn't know anything about the figures at that time. I, I didn't even know there were RoboCop toys, but I had seen the movie, loved it. Uh, and I opened up the thing, and it's the RoboCop figure. And I was like the happiest kid in the world at that moment to finally have that guy in my hands. Uh, but it didn't take long for me to, A, lose the helmet, B, lose the gun, uh, C, get another figure just so I could get a new helmet and then end up losing the gun again. Uh, right. 
that was always my frustration with that figure. Just the simple fact that, yes, it's cool where you could take the helmet off and it looks like Peter Weller, but then once you lose that thing, you lose it because it's so small. Yeah. yeah. It's the, that was, I mean, that was like the big problem with most of the toys. Like the accessories were so small, you would lose them like within the first half hour. You put it down and forget it, it disappears. But I also remember with the, um, Another drawback from the toy was, I believe, uh, it was either made out of a very heavy plastic, or I, it might have even been made out of like metal, because I remember dropping it and the thing landing on my foot, and I thought I broke my toe because it just landed like back first where you uh, snap the caps on, and the thing landed on my foot, and I was in just like so much pain. It was like basically dropping a piece of metal on your foot. Oh my god! And I remember that. Yeah, I was like literally seeing stars, and um. But I I do like how they have you know it was, a cap gun in the form of an action figure, and that was cool, but, I guess because I'm a little bit older, I was like, how can you, really make, RoboCop, which was, ultra violent Jesus story into a cartoon. How, how do you... I don't think they really, when the movie was made, intended for it to be um, geared towards kid in the action figure line. Well, you know, I, I just thought that was coming afterwards, hey, let's try to capitalize on it. But I don't, I don't, I don't ever think that was like their intent when they did everything. Oh, definitely not. I mean, you got to remember, this was the 1980s. This was the Reagan era. This was the time when something as big as Rambo would get a cartoon and an action figure line uh, or or Police Academy, even though, you know, later the films became more watered down for kids. That first one was like Animal House. You know, there was a lot of nudity and, you know, guy with his head up a horse's ass. And they decided to make a cartoon and a bunch of action figures for it. And don't forget, too... This was also the day when LJN was making the inner tech uh, water guns and they were so real kids were getting shot up on the street. And then that resulted in having to not only paint those toys, but then having to have uh, the super soaker as the big replacement because yep. that didn't look real. That wasn't going to get you shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess it was just this whole appeal with the fact that, again, there weren't really no superhero movies back then. And people were sort of getting, for kids, they were already phasing out of uh, He-Man. They were phasing out of a number of uh, toy lines of that period. Uh, Batman had not come out yet. Turtles had just come out, but hadn't really caught on just yet, not for another year. Uh, So, you know, and at the same time, so you have these figures where, they were not just doing characters from the movie, but they were also doing characters that were actually in the cartoon. Uh, so, you know, like, like I said, Robocop and the Ultra Police. It would be like these guys that were not in the film but were made for a cartoon, like Wheels Wilson and Ace Jackson. I mean, most of these guys almost could have passed off for, like, the cops in Predator 2, you know, like the, the futuristic LAPD. Yeah. Uh, and then... It was weird with the villains because the villains, they decided, let's uh, go with a bunch of street punks. Uh, So they had these guys, Headhunter and Nitro. They were the leaders of a gang called the Vandals. Uh, They were in the animated series. And I remember having um, the Chainsaw character, who was like some street punk looking guy with the yellow shirt and a vest. Uh, The weirdest figure they had for the villains was Dr. McManera. Dr. McNamara was in the movie. He was the guy that created at 209, and you only see him very briefly in the boardroom scene. Like, he's got the remote control. He's right by uh, the computer next to it. And yeah. Dick Jones is like, yes, Dr. McNamara turned the thing on. Uh, but they decide to take the most obscure background character and turn him into, like, a big villain uh, who probably looks nothing like the actor from the film, and they, you know, like, hyper-stylized him uh, you know, to look like he's this futuristic uh, gang member. It, it's just weird that they didn't try to do like a Clarence Bodiger or any of the other villains in this line, because I, I would have preferred something like that, uh, a villain that made more of a bigger impression than me than a background character. But that's just me. 
I mean, I mean, you think about it, they were gearing it towards the kids, so, I mean, you would say, okay, yeah, great, RoboCop, you know, and you're putting RoboCop in the Ultra Police, and even if you didn't see, the, if you were a kid at that time you, and you didn't see the movie, you just hear RoboCop, the Ultra Police, you know, snap action, like RoboCap action or whatever it was called, that would get the kid's attention. You wouldn't really know that he didn't have that much of a backstory for that particular character. The only thing they were like, oh, you know, let me get this the new action figure. Because, like, you know, like we said before, the movie was ultra-violent. You know, you've seen the man get blown apart. So that was how they can get away with it. Because, you know, most of the little kid at the time who would this who the tour line was being geared for, wouldn't have seen RoboCop. Like, their parents wouldn't have let them see it. So, you know, that's that's a way um, they can get around it. And I'm actually looking at some of the toy lines now, and, and in the movie, it was Ed, which stood for Enforcement Drone, which I didn't realize. Uh, yeah, at 209. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't realize the Ed stood for Enforcement Drone for the longest time. I just thought it was a stupid name. Mm -hmm. But um, in the movie, it was Ed 209. But in the toy line, when it came out, it was Ed 260. Yeah, I didn't and understand I no that. why they changed it. I mean, I know that there was like a slight uh, change with Ed 209 in the cartoon. But yeah, I never understood the name change. I always thought like that was one of the coolest toys to have as a kid was the, yeah, yeah. you know, it, I mean, it looked exactly like what I saw. Um, it was a good, it was a good enough size. I mean, it wasn't massive, but it was a good enough size when you put him up against RoboCop and it had a cat firing system in the back. So, right. you know, absolutely recreating that thing. Um, you know, like later when the Terminator toy line came out, I would do the RoboCop versus Terminator thing and Ed 209 would be part of that battle against the Terminator. Um, so absolutely. that I mean, I still have that toy. I'm still proud of it. Um, and just the accuracy of it is so dead on. It's one of the best toys that I think Kenner had ever pre created. Yeah. I'm actually looking at it now. My brother actually had this. They had like the... Um, it, was a it was the RoboCop helmet. And what was supposed to be its gun, but it's more looking like a uh, little handheld Gatling gun. And it was cool because, you know, it fired, not only did it fire like little Nerf missiles, the gun, mm -hmm. but it also fired, it was, that one was also, you know, cap action. You know, it fired the uh, caps. So I remember my brother, like I said, he grew up, you know, watching that movie, which probably explains a lot. But, um, you know, he would be running around if he wasn't in his Ghostbuster jumpsuit, he was wearing the RoboCop outfit, you know, and, you know, he would turn the head and then the body would follow, you know, just because, you know, that that's what, and he was wearing the helmet and like, I am RoboCop, you know, and that's how he would act. And I remember, you know, playing RoboCop with my brother, with the toys and with him in the, uh, in the suit. And it was just, it, it was, it was a lot of fun using all those characters because the, uh, like what we would do, we would have some of the vehicles and they would fit like some of the other superhero action figures that we would have. So we'd have like all like these big crossovers and everything, which was, I think was one of the uh, advantages because, you know, he's not just built for one particular action hero. They're like, kind of like interchangeable, you know? You know, the funny thing about these figures when they came out in 88, that was also the same year when we got Hasbro's cops. Um, right. which also had its own cartoon and a comic book line with DC Comics. And I, I always thought there was like some sort of rivalry going on because, you know, both had like the futuristic police aspect of their toys and both also had cap gun action. Uh, so the, you know, the cop figures were like, same articulation as the G.I. Joe's, just taller. Um, and I think they were a lot more flimsier and easier to break. Um, but they were definitely like some of my favorites growing up and also my cousin's favorites and the same thing, um, you know, where they had like sort of metallic parts and you had your heroes, you had your villains. Um, and they also had their vehicles too, uh, going back to RoboCop. So 
even though none of the vehicles were in the film, uh, they they I think some of them were in the cartoon, but they were just exciting to have, like the the Robo yeah. One. Uh, that was something I remember getting for Christmas. It, it looked it looked like my parents' Honda uh, Prelude, because the way it kind of like shapes with a slant in the front and it kind of feels mm-hmm. really small. Um, so that was always a cool thing to have, even though sometimes I lost the side missiles and the laser came off. Uh, and that door, that, that little like plastic glass door would always fall off and disappear someplace. Um, yeah. Same thing also with the robo jailer. That, that was like their big thing where you could like throw the guy into the jail. Uh, it was like this little almost four by four truck kind of deal. Um, looking at it now, it reminds me of, you've seen Tango and Cash with Sylvester Stallone? Yeah. Yeah. Remember yeah, the, the, uh. That, that truck big, at the uh, end, this, yeah. yeah, yeah, at the end, yep. That's totally what that reminds me of. Looking at it now, um, and I think we, me and my cousin, may have even mentioned that when we saw the movie as kids growing up. <laughs> um, I didn't have the RoboCopter, which you know, I, I never saw any reason to have a, a helicopter for RoboCop, uh, and the RoboCycle, which I think was later repainted into the bat cycle for kenner's batman figures um and some would even say that that might have even been inspiration for the motorcycle in the remake uh because that was the one thing that popped up when the first pictures from that came about uh and then the same thing like the one of the villains had their own little motorcycle um speaking of the prototypes uh, or actually the um what you were saying before about the helmet uh, there was a prototype for a Robo Glove that never came out. So if you remember in the film when he would have like the spike come out from his hand and then he'd stick it yeah. into the computer. So we were actually supposed to get something like that as a kid. Uh, with the same thing, the spike coming out, but you also could like fire missiles out of it. Uh, and I guess they didn't sell it because they didn't want kids shooting each other with plastic missiles. <laughs> <laughs> or stabbing yeah, each other like there. he does at the end. <laughs> Yeah, and we yeah, also no, that that would have been cool having the glove because they had they gave you the gun and the uh, the helmet, so why not have the glove? That would have been cool. Yeah, why not have the whole costume? <laughs> um, exactly. There was a dude I met I met one year at a Comic Con. He had no joke, soup to nuts. He built himself the entire RoboCop suit. Really? Oh my god! The thing looked like he looked like yeah, it looked like he took it from Peter Weller's garage. He even had it where, like, he uh, molded his face on top of the um, the helmet. So, you know, when uh, Weller took the mask off, mm-hmm. how you can see, like, his face with, like, the, the back of the head was, like, metal? That He did the exact same thing. He said it took about four years to make. Wow. I mean, just like you talking about it now, I'm, I'm thinking about, like, this video I remember seeing years ago. Uh like Peter Weller, I think he was at some show and him and a guy dressed up as Robocop, they're like standing next to each other. So Weller's playing the pinball game. The guy in the cosplay Robocop is playing the arcade game right next to him. It was like so surreal, but so cool at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, as far as like, just to kind of wrap up on the, uh, the Kenner figures, there were only two lines of toys and, you know, later they added more villains, more of the police characters. We got a glowing in the dark Robocop figure, which was pretty famous. If you ask me, yeah. that was the first one that had like the, like he had a different arm, like a, instead of an arm, he had a gun. So it was sort of like what they would do in the third film. Uh, and it was pretty popular because then later NECA, NECA Toys wound up remaking that actual figure as an exclusive. Um, but as far as the stuff we didn't get back then, we were also supposed to get a Robo Tank, and the tank actually resembles the tank from Robocop 3, uh, but if it was just the Ultra Police colors and not, you know, like an all black tank. And there was also like a, a Vandal car, which, by the way, uh, it was like a mobile assault vehicle that later was repainted and produced for the Terminator 2 action figures. Um, so, like, if you ever wanted to pay, repaint that thing and make it look like that, 
it's very easy to do if you can get that vehicle. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that, that was in a nutshell, the Kenner toys. We didn't get any play sets uh, outside of Robocop, Dr. McManera, Lewis, and Sergeant Reed, and Ed 209. There were no other, no other toys from the, uh, from the film. And right. I guess after a while, they, they just didn't fly off the shelves as much by 1989, you know, because at that point, Batman had come out, uh, then Turtles started getting popular. So in all likelihood, you know, the kids just stopped collecting them. And it was already two years after the first film, people were already waiting for the sequel. Um, and then when we did get the sequel in 1990, no toys were produced whatsoever. And that was a big disappointment. Because uh, I remember being so excited when I first saw the trailer. Like, I remember actually in the trailer when you see the uh, the car get blown up with the missile and then he comes out. I would try to recreate that in my grandpa's house uh, with the Robo-1 and him in it coming out and shooting at the bad guys. But that was as close as we could get. We, we didn't really get, like, uh, a Kane figure. I mean, I would have loved to have had the... Uh, the Kane slash RoboCop 2 toy to have Robo fight with in my backyard. Right. Um, but again, you know, I, I think because of the R rating, because, you know, the sequel was far more crude and more violent uh, than the second one, or the first film, that it just was, at that point, they were trying to restrict the kids from seeing it, but kids like me saw it anyway. Um, so, you know, that was just like a sore disappointment of the day as I remember. Yeah, but, I mean, you also got to keep in mind that um, with a toy line like RoboCop, there's only so much you can do. There's only so many vehicles you can put out because, like, RoboCop, like, if you go by the movie, he only really had, like, who was he really fighting? He was fighting big government. Right. You know, he, he was fighting a corporation, so there was no real one uh, bad guy, like you no know, Joker or Lex Luthor or uh, something like that for him to go toe-to-toe with. And since he was a cop, you know, you, you have, like, the police station, and that's it. There's only, like, so many um, so many vehicles you can put out. So you, when they came out with the toy, they had to know that they only had a finite amount of things they can do with it like lines they can do and half times that the kid have to buy you know can he you know you let's repackage robocop let's make him glow in the dark let's give him a gun arm you know there's only so many things you do with it so they had to know it was finite so by the time the second movie rolled around okay we're introducing a new robot villain but they probably would have been like okay we're not really gonna waste the time and the money to put out a toy line when there's nothing, we can't really expand upon it, you know? Yeah. So then something weird would happen, uh, after RoboCop two, you know, um, 1991, I'm reading a star log magazine and they're already showing pictures for RoboCop three. Uh, and they also, I think they announced there that Peter Weller wasn't playing a part anymore. Now they had another actor, Robert John Burke. And the only picture I saw was him with the jetpack. So I'm wondering for like a year, when is this movie going to get released? Uh, and then, weirdly enough, I believe it was late 1992 or maybe summer 92. I'm in Toys R Us, and then I see like these three new Robocop figures, but they're not from Kenner. They're from a company called Toy Island, which I had never heard of. But these figures were the same exact size as the Kenner toys. And to be honest, I thought they were made a little better uh, in terms of the likeness and the helmet stayed put. And the gun looked accurate to his actual gun. Um, but you only had like three different RoboCop toys, all pretty much um, with different sound effects. So there was like a button in the in the chest. Right. So you had one with the jet pack, one where you could take off the arm and give him the detachable arm with the gun and the missile and the flamethrower. And a third one, which was a repair station. I guess it's like where he goes and gets fixed up when he's battle damaged. Yeah. Um, so clearly... That was another one. Yeah. I'm actually looking at the line now. They have a battle damage RoboCop where you can, like, change his chest plate 
from having it all like you know nice and shiny to having one where it's all um you know scarred up yeah that would come with the television series that would hit so like i said this is what happened that was so weird so what happened was Orion had went bankrupt around 91 and they started selling off some films and some films got shelved and Robocop 3 was one of the films they shelved. Uh, they were planning to put it out in the summer 92, but apparently I guess, th you know, they were still having their legal troubles and it sat on the shelf while these toys got released. A, vi a number of video games were put out for Nintendo and Sega and even on the PC and Dark Horse Comics even put out the comic book adaptation, but nobody saw what this movie looked like. So it didn't hit until about November of 93, which at that point, everybody knew what was going to happen. They knew Lewis was going to die. They knew Robocop was going to team with a bunch of homeless people to fight back against OCP and their rehab team. Uh the funny thing about that movie too is how they have like the, I, I always love the commercials that they put into the RoboCop movies. The ones in the first one yeah. are the best. The the nuke, um, uh, the one with the uh, the artificial heart, and uh, yeah, the yeah. sunscreen which is all blue. Yeah, yeah, for RoboCop two, the the, the Magna Vault commercial. Yes, I always um, on the second one when they do like the the telephon and the guy with the violin. It's like, you know, upside yes, down. Uh, Spider -Man yeah, I would always rewind that part on tape because it was just so freaking hilarious. Uh, I just would lose my shit every time like he would finish and he'd fall down. <laughs> um, but yeah, in the yeah. third one, they, they pulled back on the commercials, but what they did was they actually repainted the Kenner figures and did a Johnny Rehab commercial. So he took the toys and now they were representing the rehab team. Yeah, you can probably find it on YouTube. So I always thought that was like so hilarious that they would kind of like give a throwback to Kenner in that regard, especially since by that point it was PG-13, so now they could make this yeah. for kids. And that pissed off the fans, because like, no, you right. can't water down Robocop. That wasn't the intent. Because Orion thought... This was Transformers. This was Turtles. You know, Robocop works for kids. No, it doesn't. But they didn't care <laughs> anyway because they were bankrupt and they needed the money. So yeah. let's make some more toys. And then to sell it off for a television series, which I got to say, the show was a piece of shit. Clearly, it was shot in Canada. Yeah. They, um, The actor they cast, who actually is on my Facebook page, Richard Eden, um, they made him look like a leukemia patient when he doesn't have the helmet on. And I'm not trying to knock the guy personally. I know he had to work with what he had to work with. But clearly, they were trying to make that show too family-friendly. And also because, for some weird reason, they couldn't license other characters from the film, except for RoboCop, Alex Murphy. They just basically took the characters from the film and just renamed them. So Anne Lewis becomes Lisa Madigan, and Sergeant... Reed becomes uh, mm -hmm. Stan Parks. They even have a villain in the show, Puttface Morgan, who my cousin <laughs> thought was the guy, Emil, from the first one, you know, when he got splashed with the chemicals and gets yeah. splattered. He thought it was him from Resurrected from the Dead. I was like, no, it's not. And another person told me it was uh, Robert England because the guy looked like him so much with the makeup on. Uh, but he was just like a throwaway comic book villain, you know, just he probably could have been cool in an R rated situation. But otherwise, it was just an excuse for him to have a weekly bad guy that he didn't kill off. And they barely suddenly kill people on that show, um, not even violently either. It was just very subtle the half the time that they would do it. But like you said, in the toy line, they would have a figure of RoboCop where, for the first time, you saw how he looked without his chest. You know, and you saw his insides, and then you could yeah. replace it and put battle damage armor, battle damage helmet. Um, I gotta say, that was kind of my favorite toy, except sometimes the um, the, the little things that they're supposed to hold on to it would break off. So that was the only downside of the battle damage figure. Uh, yeah, I mean, taking it on and off like that, especially when it like it was like um, it would like snap into place. So you know, you, you put it on and off like four or five times, the thing would snap and you'd be done. But um, 
I was more into the vehicle end of things. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, like, how many, like, when I would play superheroes with my brother, you know, we would have, like, 40 Batman. You know, how many Robocops do you really need? Right. So I was more, we were more interested in, like, the, um, the vehicle end of things. But, uh, no, I, I remember the cartoon. I remember the live action show. I remember, I, I'm like, hey, Robocop, let's give it a shot watching it and i was like this is not robocop you know like who are these people yeah i mean it, it did get ridiculous like it, it went the batman route with the toys as far as like there were three different glowing robocop figures and yellow and red and uh one that's like an emergency response toy so he could have a new helmet and all kinds right. of different gadgets weird shit and then they even created a figure of the Commander Cash cartoon, uh, which was like one of the more rare figures in the line. I think it's worth quite a bit of pennies if you could find it. Uh, but the coolest thing about the show was when they got Rowdy Roddy Piper to play like the real guy that Commander Cash was based on. Uh, sadly, yeah. he never got a figure, and he should have. That would have been fun. Unless you could actually customize it with a Mattel toy in the WWE figures. Um but speaking of the vehicles, you know, I didn't have any of them for the television series, but I thought they were kind of interesting that they had a, they had a new car that was actually like a Ford Mustang, like a 94 Mustang. Uh, and I used to confuse it with the Ford Taurus from the, uh, from the film. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always used to see that around and it was pretty nice. It was pretty accurate uh, from the show. They had like a Humvee, they had a, a mobile detention center, uh, a jet cycle, which I did have, and that was kind of, sort of like a throwaway toy, by the way. Um, and there was even a cryo chamber, which I think was the one from the show. I don't know what the hell that does, but uh, you know, that was the closest thing to a playset as far as uh, Robocop toys were concerned. Um, and there was even like a big doll that they had that also you could remove the chest. It would light up. It would make all kinds of sounds, you know, serve the public trust, uh, your move, creep, you know, mm -hmm. like saying all those famous yeah. catchphrases. Um, and there were even like three inch figures, uh, one of them that I had. And um, they made similar figures for this line for Terminator and for Rambo. So that I guess you can like mix and match and had them all have like a little battle royale if you wanted to and have them team up with your G.I. Joes because they were essentially the same size. Um, in a nutshell, that's pretty much like what they did with the TV show. And that lasted about a year because uh, the show was a piece of shit who was going to really want to buy those figures unless you're a Robocop fan. Um, and then we, again, they, they didn't make any more movies. They didn't do any more of the show. Uh, but I don't know if you remember, Mike, but then about 1997, 1998, we got another RoboCop cartoon and we would get an action figure line of it. And that was RoboCop Alpha Commando. And this was another one that I remember hearing about in Wizard Comics and being pretty excited that RoboCop was coming back in animated form. And apparently... Uh, one of the guys that was a showrunner on the Fox X-Men cartoon was running this, so I thought, okay, this should be pretty good. Uh, the idea being that it would be long after the films, and he's been frozen for decades, and then he comes out, it's a different world now, and he's equipped with all kinds of new gadgets and stuff. This was horrible. This was a horrible yeah, show. I'm yeah. I'm I mean, looking at the uh, the line now, and yeah, no, it it it's it looks as bad as it sounds. It, it, they make the they make RoboCop look like like a big body, little tiny head. And it looks like you stole Cyclops' visor. <laughs> I remember vaguely hearing about the Alpha Commando, but uh, I don't remember watching it. But I've just just. I just Googled it right now and just looking at some of these guys, I was like, I'm like, yeah, not going to last. Mm -mm. Yeah. And you know, every episode that I remember seeing, cause I, I watched a little bit of it when it was on weekday mornings, 
I, I just couldn't stomach through it. They they basically treated him like a uh, a living Swiss Army knife. He you know they gave him all kinds yeah. of gadgets. He could do just about anything. Um, and you know they they talked about how Arnold Schwarzenegger was almost going to play RoboCop at one point. He was actually the studio's choice, and the producers said no. He's going to look like the Michelin Man in a suit. This is yeah. what would have happened if. Arnold Schwarzenegger would have played RoboCop. He would have been too big. He would have been flimsy as hell. And they would have tried to, like, I don't know. Like, it's like they wanted to do Iron Man before we even got an Iron Man movie and still mess yeah. it up badly. They even give him his female partner, who's not Lewis, but is a character named Nancy Minor. She's, so she's actually named after Nancy Allen and one of the screenwriters from the original and they did something weird where in the show she's like this uh, this Asian human cop, but in the toy line they make her into a female RoboCop, which made no sense. She doesn't get yeah. killed and turned to a cyborg. You know what the hell were they thinking with that? You know, and the like the cycle that they made for him, the like the motorcycle, and they, they even had like a new version of Ed Two Hundred Nine, which they called Ed Five Hundred Nine, the Rexor. Mm. This was crap, man. This was just a lame ass excuse just to keep interest in Robocop alive. But it just added to the fact that after that first movie, nobody could get it right the way Paul Verhoeven did. And they just completely yeah. misinterpreted what that film was about. Yeah, I mean with the original like the the saying goes when they made the original RoboCop, they caught lightning in a bottle. You know, it was the right cast, it was the right story, it was the right time. They caught it, and that was it. Now, everybody's like, oh, we have to make, because it was the 80s, let's make toys out of everything. Let's make, uh, you know, let's make it bigger and better. And it didn't work after that. It was like, okay, you had a great idea. You know, you did your one story, and that's where it should have ended. I mean, the second one, meh, it was okay. It wasn't the best movie, but, you know, you, you can't make a toy line based on, you know, a, a uh, based on a movie like that, where you kill all your bad guys in the first movie, and then you're fighting, you know, corporate America. The kids aren't going to understand it, and... It, it's just not gonna it's not gonna flow you know and you can only make robocop so many times like we said you know how many you know he glows in the dark he has a gun arm he has a jetpack they like okay i have like 500 robocops what am i gonna do with all these things you know mm -hmm. he shoots caps he doesn't shoot caps you know where does suit be robocop i mean after a while you're like okay what else is out there keep in mind i mean these were kids and you know, we all can relate. We play with something for five minutes, put it down, went on to the next thing. You know? Yeah, yeah I mean, it just got to a point, like you said, I mean, how many Robocop figures could you actually buy in that same mold? Because, um, you know, in addition to those figures, I also had, I think, the guy Randy Bowen, who's like a famous sculptor, he made a Robocop uh, model doll that I still have. And at the time, it was like the best RoboCop toy that I had because it was deadly accurate to how he looked in the film and had Peter Weller's likeness. The only downside was it was such a hollow figure that it was easy to break the helmet. It was easy to break the legs. It was like this very flimsy plastic. But other than that, um, I felt like that was like the best RoboCop figure that I was going to get outside of these yeah. smaller toys. And... And like I said, the, the movies just didn't get any better. The TV shows sucked. And every time they tried to find a way to bring it back, you know, nobody would get it right. So over time, I think maybe the, uh, you know, as Orion had changed hands to MGM and other people took over the license, they started to get it right in the sense that the first is the best. So that's why back when 2012, when uh, NECA Toys decided to make a RoboCop figure, they made it so this was as 
accurate to the way he is in the film, down to the metal, down to the spring loader. There's even a, uh, a battle damage version of him. And also they even have repaints of that figure to resemble his uh, video game counterparts. So they knew the audience that they were targeting at that time um, in terms of the people that grew up with the film, grew up with the original video games that came out, and didn't try to start throwing it into the direction of the third movie or the TV show because all that stuff was just crap, plain and simple. So, I mean, when they did it, they aimed for us. You know, the guys, the people who grew up with the original movie. And like you said, that's why they went back to, um, you know, the Peter Weller, how he looked with the metal and all the detail. Because that would appease, you know, the collectors now who grew up with the original film and who who appreciated it for what it was. Now, I'm not going to really get too heavy on the remake. There are a set of action figures from a company, uh, Jada Toys, and I, I had seen these like in FYE and some other stores. I really don't have too much to say because I, I thought with the remake... First of all, I was totally against it. It's just one of those movies you really cannot touch. But the fact is, um, when I did finally see it on tape, I thought the first 20 minutes of it were decent, and then it went downhill Mm -hmm. after that. I hated the design from the very beginning, this sort of hybrid between Iron Man and Batman. Uh, The exposed hand, which I never understood because it was so freaking naughty enough. Uh, if it was trying to be a throwback to the whole loser arm part, sorry guys, it didn't work. Um, yeah, that I was gonna say that that's what it was from because in the original script for the original one, he had his Robocop had his, his real arm and he like get rid of it. And mm-hmm. yeah, that made no sense. If you're gonna give the guy a bionic body, just go the whole nine yards, you know? Yeah, and um, you know, the, the only good like diamond in the rough was when they had a suit that paid homage to the original suit. Uh, it's not any better, but it, it still was like, I, I would have preferred him wearing that than that piece yeah. of crap. And it's always laughable just to see Michael Keaton look at him and be like, yeah, we gotta make it more tactical. Let's paint him in black. <laughs> paint him in black. Exactly. The only, the only good thing that I liked about it was they made uh, the Ed 209 droid a little more badass looking. Well, that was. Oh, he, he, yeah. he looked like he had more teeth to it. He had probably the the one scene. Actually, there's two scenes that I liked in the film. One was, actually, no, three. One was when he's dis, uh, Robocop is disassembled, and we find out he's nothing but a bunch of head and lungs. Two right. was the opening scene with Ed 209 being thrown into a rack and almost killing an Iraqi kid. I thought, you know, that that's something I would have seen in an earlier Robocop film. And the third was when, uh, I think, when Murphy's partner gets shot. Like, there, there's that whole shootout in the beginning. Uh, and I thought that was a pretty good scene, like, pretty intense. That's the way the movie should have been, and clearly wasn't. Um, so, that's the least I could say about the remake. It was crap. The director is very good. I've yeah. seen his movies, Jose Padilla, but this was just a bad attempt to uh, I guess try to universe build, try to you know start a new superhero franchise without the Marvel and DC license. It's whatever. It, it sucked. And yeah, yeah the, the toys were not any better. I mean, it, I gave it a shot. I went, I saw it, and I was like, meh. It wasn't, it honestly, it it gave me the feel it should have been made in like the late 80s, early 90s, just way, it gave me that feel like I'm watching something very campy, something made on a shoestring budget, you know, it was like, let's just take whatever and throw it in, call it Robocop and hope people forget about the original, Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm, I'm not crazy about remakes either. And um, it's just, you know, it kind of justified my position that if you do a remake, it's never going to be as good as the original and don't even try. Yeah, so um, I'm going to end pretty much on a happier note in terms of RoboCop because, you know, like I said, the remake sucked, but we've gotten yeah. better toys since then. 
uh, the company Hot Toys has made some really deadly accurate uh, figures of RoboCop and of Alex Murphy with Peter Waller's full likeness. Um, and there's also, I think, um, Phil Tippett's company has made uh, models of the models that they use for Ed 209 and also for, for Kane for RoboCop 2. They've actually... Um, in limited quantities, reproduce them as action figures that you could buy exclusively. I haven't been able to find them, but I know they cost quite a bit to get. And then recently at Toy Fair, we see that now uh, Super 7 with their reaction line is also producing a line of three-quarter inch Robocop toys from the first film. And even though they're still in prototype form, they look very exciting. So we're not only getting Robocop now, uh, we're getting the Emil figure when he's caught in the, the chemical. Uh, we're getting a Bixby Snyder figure, the, you know, I'll buy that for a dollar guy, which shocked me. Right. We're even getting a, a Mr. Kenny figure, the guy that gets blown up by Ed 209 in the boardroom. That that was a shocker. Uh, and an Ed 209 toy, which I, I'm going to collect this whole set. It, it just, this is really cool, and I'm hoping that they do more characters out of this. Well, to, like you said, to end on a happy note, I've heard rumors that they're making another RoboCop film yes. with your Weller, and kind of forgetting that the remake, and I think everything from RoboCop 2 on ever happened. Yes, if if my sources are correct, they're supposed to be taking um, the original writers, uh, Michael Miner and Ed Neumeier, they had a script called Corporate Wars, which they wrote after RoboCop 1, but due to the writer's strike, it got rejected by the studio. So from what I understand, they're actually going back to that. And Neil Blomkamp, who directed District 9 and Elysium, is going to be directing it. And I think he's a worthy successor to Paul Verhoeven, who's getting up there in age yeah. now. Um, but I am really hoping for Weller, and I think it's a good sign with that KFC ad. Um, you know, it's yeah, not him in the suit. Yeah, it's not him in the suit, but it's definitely the voice. It's the voice. But you know what? The good thing about the suit, you put, you could put anybody in the suit, and give them that visor. So the only thing you're seeing is like the guy's mouth. Have Weller come in and just do voiceover. You know, maybe. Um, Maybe just have him do uh, the if if he takes the helmet off at any point. Maybe just have Weller do uh, close up headshots. But you put you could put anybody in the suit and just have Weller do voiceover. You know, because RoboCop is one of those characters where it's it, it's kind of like Darth Vader. The voice and the costume make the character. You know, oh, you can okay. you could put anybody in the suit. As long as you have James Earl Jones doing the voice of Vader, it is Vader. Same deal with RoboCop. You can put anybody in a suit, as long as you have Peter Weller's voice, he's RoboCop. Well, I'll even do you one better. He could do a motion capture suit, and he wouldn't have to he put on... Do. He wouldn't have to put on the armored suit. He could still do the miming technique, and with today's technology, if they wanted to de-age him to look like he did in 87, they could do that very easily. Oh, yeah, Definitely. Um, so yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll get figures of that if it, if it gets made and hopefully, you know, Peter Weller, please come back. Cause you know, you're still badass even in your seventies now. So, uh, that's, you know, basically as far as Robocop goes, uh, usually, like I said, I like to end with the figures that we wish we could have had as kids. And I think it's pretty obvious, you know, the ones I would have wanted, I would have wanted Clarence Bodiger, Dick Jones, the whole gang of uh, Clarence Bodiger's guys, Emil and, you know, the, the black dude uh, and the dude that was in Swamp Thing, uh, Ray Wise's character, um, a Robo Kane toy, if they had ever made toys of RoboCop 2. And I would have wanted some play sets. I would have wanted the OCP boardroom or a police station from uh, the first film. Whole lot of things that they were missing on because they concentrated so much on the Marvel cartoon. Uh, yeah. and even though we're getting some of that here and there, especially with this reaction line, it just would have been nice to have back then. It would have made my childhood that much extra special. What about you, Mike? Uh, I gotta say, the toy I really would have liked to have would have been, uh, the RoboCane toy. Mm -hmm. RoboCop 2. Um, I'm not really too crazy on the playsets. I was, like I said, I'm more of a vehicle type man. So, uh, 
if they would have done, you know, a couple more vehicles other than just like the toy, um, the cars that they put out. Like I said, I had the helicopter. If they would have done, you know, some other things like that, I would have been happier uh, as a pig and shit. Yeah. But, um, I would have liked to have had yeah. the, the Ford Taurus and the motorcycle from the second movie. Uh, yeah, and you know, do quite a few things. And, and I know, like, even in the cartoon, they they had other characters from the film that were like small characters that they turned into big, uh, recurring characters in the animated series. So, like, some of the uh, the cop characters and the villains that popped in would show up. They they could have done figures for that back then, and um, you know, shame that we didn't get them. But you know. Definitely more vehicles, more play sets for me, and a lot more to bad guys, and I think it just would have been pretty damn amazing. Uh, so that is it for us on the Silver Screen Action Figure Podcast on RoboCop. And, uh, you know, if you want to comment, if you want to make suggestions for future episodes, uh, you know, follow me at Twitter at Silver Screen AF1. Like us on Facebook at our Silver Screen Action Figure Podcast fan page. And you could also email me about anything about uh, the podcast at silverscreenafpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget, I make films, so follow me on uh, also on Twitter at AJ Epics and on Facebook, AJ Epics Productions and uh, AJ, AJ Epics Productions.com, my website, uh, for all the updates about my current projects and upcoming projects. So, uh, Mike, your stuff? Uh, I'm a filmmaker also. You can follow me on Facebook on at Hamster Pellet Productions. I'm also on Instagram under Hamster Pellet Productions. Uh, Going to have a website coming up soon. Um, keep an eye out. New things from the pe pellets are coming real soon. All right, guys. So uh, I'm going to just sign it off by saying something that, uh, you know, if the kids want to hear it at home, stay out of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so long, guys. See you at the movies. Can you fly, Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>